Good morning once again, and welcome to our online worship service here at Colonial Heights United Methodist Church. Uh, thanks for being with us once again, and this is great because it is the second Sunday of Easter, and we continue a season of celebration, a new life and resurrection uh, all around us. And you can see evidence of that uh, outside, although we've had a little bit of a cold snap, but we do this in East Tennessee. We have some warm spells, and then we have a few extra winters as we get closer. But it is good to be here, and it is good to continue to celebrate that Christ is risen. This morning, we want to share a few announcements with you in our church. First, we want to let you know that tonight at 6 o'clock, we'll be at Colonial Heights Baptist Church for a community worship service focused on an Easter celebration, but also uh, celebrating that uh, one of our colleagues in ministry, Reverend Dr. Greg Burton, will be retiring soon. It's also his birthday. Uh, and so we will celebrate and thank God for his service, but also uh, continuing that season of resurrection, which is new life and new chapters. Thanks to everyone who has already brought items for Hope Helps. That is the mission collection for this month. Uh, Hope Helps is a ministry in the Kingsport community that helps in a variety of ways. You can find out more information about what they need in our newsletter. Uh, but they need different items such as kitchen items, bathroom items, and household items. And those will be collected and taken to Hope Helps later at the end of the month. Next Sunday, we're going to say goodbye to someone that's very special, our youth intern, Raina Barton, who's been with us for the last two years, serving in different capacities, singing in the praise team at times, and also serving with our youth group. But she's been a cheerful face and a face that has uh, shared a lot of love with us, and, and I hope we have been able to share that with her. We are going to uh, have a time in our service next week for her to share a few words, and if you'd like to support Raina as she goes on to a new chapter, and she'll be serving in North Georgia at a United Methodist Conference camp for the next 18 months. As we continue now and begin this time together, let us open with a word of prayer. Lord of Resurrection Surprises, Open our hearts this day to the presence of Jesus. Erase our excuses for doubt and unbelief. And exchange them for a strong witness to the power of your mercy and love. Give us courage and challenge us to walk the path of discipleship. Knowing that Jesus goes before us, leading and guiding our steps. In the name of the risen Savior we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's gospel lesson is from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on the day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Our church's stained glass window is something that you see on a weekly basis if you watch our online program. You'll see that it depicts a Jesus that's resurrected. The fact that Jesus' resurrected body continues to carry the mark of his wounds is an important image for us right now, especially in the world we live. The world we live is wounded. The effects of natural disasters, food shortages, wars in Eastern Europe and in the Middle East, an upcoming presidential election that's going to be contentious. It seems like rhetoric on both sides looks nothing like Jesus. And all of us carry wounds. All of us carry pain. Some of our wounds are physical. Some of our wounds are emotional. Some are both. Wounds tell a story. And many of those wounds don't heal. Some of our wounds may be wounds that we received in places of worship even. They're spiritual. The church can be a place of wounds. We fail sometimes and we cause wounds. We need to acknowledge that, but we also don't need to shy away from what we can do, and that is look more like Christ. But it was the wounds of Jesus that Thomas wanted to see in order to believe. Now, the disciples had told Thomas, we have seen the Lord, but that wasn't enough for Thomas. Thomas, unfortunately, in his questioning of those disciples in his doubting has always been referred to as doubting Thomas. And while the Gospel of John is the only gospel that tells the story about him, there's more to Thomas's ministry, there's more to his discipleship than this moment of doubt. When Jesus is first notified that his friend Lazarus was very ill in John chapter 11, Jesus is in no hurry to travel to, Beth to Bethany in Judea. He waits two days before traveling. And Bethany is an only short distance from Jerusalem where the religious leaders are already plotting against Jesus and his disciples. And most of the other disciples are worried about being arrested or persecuted. Only one of the disciples is willing to speak up and courageously proclaim, let us go so that we may die with him. That disciple was Thomas. The second time we hear from Thomas, is during the moments of the Last Supper, which after Jesus has washed the feet of his disciples and told them all that's going to happen to him, Jesus says these words to his disciples. He says, In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. I will go and prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to myself. You know the way where I am going. And at that Last Supper, 
the scriptures say that the disciples were confused, but not willing to say anything. But one of the disciples has the courage to speak up and ask the question, saying, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? That disciple was Thomas. Prompted by the question, Jesus responds, and to the others in that room, offering one of the most powerful statements of his identity. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And finally, we have our story this morning, John chapter 20, the end of the day on the Easter morning that we read about last week. This is the third time we hear from Thomas. And on this third time, Thomas is forever ingrained in so much of our memory in the church and Christians everywhere that he's a doubter. We're told that when Jesus appears to Thomas or appears to the disciples, all but Thomas is present. When Thomas returns, he hears from the others that Jesus has appeared to them, but he tells his fellow disciples that he will not believe unless he puts the hands and the wounds of the nails on his hands and on his side. And when Jesus appears to the disciples again, this time with Thomas present, Jesus responds to Thomas's amazement saying, do you believe because you see me? Blessed are those who don't see and yet they believe. Now, as a result, again, Thomas is forever remembered as a doubter. But is that really fair? After all, Jesus never brandishes him with a scarlet letter of the word doubt. The reality is that there were many times that each of the disciples doubted Jesus. Each of the disciples feared doing what he preached. There were even moments when the disciples intentionally went against his teachings. But in this case, it's Thomas who receives the lecture that the other disciples deserved and the ones we need to hear. There's no indication that any of the other disciples believed in Jesus' resurrection before he physically appeared to them as well. In fact, when Mary Magdalene returns from the tomb saying that Jesus is gone, Peter and John immediately take off running to the tomb to see it with their own eyes. And I've often wondered if Thomas doubted the disciples, not because he did not have faith to believe in the resurrection, but because perhaps he had lost trust in his fellow disciples. The scripture says that the disciples were behind closed doors. They were hiding. That's when Jesus appeared to them. Where was Thomas? He doesn't appear to be hiding or dwelling about things. There's a reason he's not with the other disciples. But what was that reason? Maybe Thomas was ashamed of their fear. Perhaps he was disappointed things had not gone the way he had hoped. Jesus never says, that we are as a church to refer to Thomas as a doubter. In the other stories about Thomas, we see a disciple of courage, a disciple willing to ask honest questions when others were not. But doubting Thomas is the label that's put on him. Which gets me to this whole idea about wounds. We've talked about wounds earlier when I described to you a few moments ago, I mentioned We live in a world of physical, emotional, and spiritual wounds that so many of us have witnessed and still have scars of. Some of us are wounded right now in our very lives. And there's another kind of wound as well. And this wound seems to be prevalent everywhere we go. The self-inflicted wounds that we cause ourselves. Maybe we just don't have trust and faith in our own selves to be who Jesus calls us to be. Maybe we don't feel we are worthy. Maybe we don't feel that Jesus loves us. Maybe we live too much into the labels that the world puts on us, the ways the world tries to define us. Here's the thing. The message of the Easter season is a message of living hope. In 1 Peter, the apostle says, By His great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It is a living hope for us because the wounds could not hold down Jesus and the wounds of the world and the wounds placed on us by the world cannot hold us down. The wounds that Jesus took in his hands, his feet, his side, they're no more. 
The scars remain though, but the scars remain to tell a story. And I've seen so many people be able to turn their wounds and their scars into stories of hope, where they've been able to help share a message of hope with a neighbor, with a loved one. Those scars remain, but our stories can change because of the living hope that is a resurrected Jesus. Because of Jesus' wounds, we are given an opportunity, a way to live, so that the world and its wounds don't have to define us and set a course for us. Hear the words of the psalmist in Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Words for us to remember and live by. Do not let the wounds of this world hold you down in this season of Easter. Let us pray. Everlasting God, all of us carry wounds and scars and the things that this life has put on us. But just like your son, by carrying these things, we are not separated from your love. But through Christ, we are brought closer to it. Help us not to let the world define us. Help us to let you define us by living as the disciples you've called us to be. So may we continue, O God, to proclaim to a world that Christ is risen in all that we do and why that is living hope for every single person in this world. In your precious name, your risen name, amen.